All right, so what PMI says is that as you're managing a project, there are many activities that a project manager is responsible for. But ultimately, they're accountable for the success or failure of the project. So in order to be a competent project manager, and in order to bring my project to a successful conclusion, there are a lot of things that have to happen. And there are project management relationship, rela uh, project management activities in addition to the project work, right? I'm going to delegate the work. I'm not the one out there hammering nails into boards to build a building, but I'm the one handling the scheduling and the budgeting. I'm addressing risks and communications and all those pieces. So what you see in front of you, this is the PMI framework. And again, I want to stress the fact that this could come up on the test. Now, how much of this could come up on the test? You don't need to memorize the 10 knowledge areas, the five process groups, and the 47 processes. But man, if you come down to about the middle of the chart, and actually towards the end, you'll see Chapter 11, Risk. Plan risk management, identify risks, perform qualitative risk analysis, perform quantitative risk analysis, plan risk responses. And then you jump over in that row, uh, two spaces, and you see control risk. So what I want to stress is we just looked at ISACA's risk management life cycle, but PMI also says they also have their say and their framework on how to address risk. So I would be able to discuss risk regardless of the different framework to understand the flow. Because quite honestly, PMI's framework isn't very different from ISACA's framework, right? We said you identify risk, you perform risk assessment, you respond to risk, and then you monitor and control risk. And you'll see that here in the PMI framework as well. Now, what's kind of interesting about this um, is with the PMI framework, all of these activities, the project manager oversees and makes sure that they get done, and these are all activities that produce a result, if you will. They have a purpose, and that purpose we often refer to as an output. So, and again, this isn't a PMP class, but I want to familiarize you with this enough so that we can kind of, um, so that the way ISACA would have us look at it in relation to the exam. So when we look at things like develop project charter, well, develop project charter has a purpose and an output. And the output of the develop project charter process is a project charter. Right? It makes perfect sense. Now, it's not always that easy. If you come down that column to the very final one, you've got a process called identify stakeholders. It's basically a tool we use that identifies the stakeholders and also helps us prioritize them. So as you look at this chart, all of those processes in the middle, every single one of those processes has a purpose. And the purpose to that process is tied to an output. Okay? So quickly, you know, just to, just to kind of see that, often those processes also require inputs. So for instance, um, let's say plan scope management. If you look in the middle, or no, 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 let's say collect requirements. If you can take a look at the scope the row addressing scope, and you'll see that one of the processes for scope is to collect requirements. Well, think about this. Who is going to give me my requirements? That's going to come from my stakeholders, right? I go to my stakeholders to get my requirements. So if you look at Chapter 13, identify, um, I'm sorry, if you look at this last process we talked about, identify stakeholders, well, that gives me the stakeholder register, and I need the stakeholder register in order to collect requirements. So if we were to look at that process, it would have an input of stakeholder register and an output of requirements documentation. I don't know if that makes sense, but if you kind of take a look at it on this slide, you know, if I have a recipe, my ingredients are the input. Okay, 
I'm going to perform some pro uh, some activities like mix and stir and bake, and then it's going to output. So if my process is to make an omelet, right, the input ought to be eggs and cheese and bacon and other things, right? And then the output should be an omelet. What if I don't produce an omelet, though? What if instead I produce a frittata or more likely badly burned scrambled eggs, right? Well, then I need to make changes to my plan and those changes come right back around and become inputs. So that's kind of the relationship across the project management or the PMI processes. So what you're gonna see as we look at some of these processes, you're gonna see they have inputs and they have outputs.